What's going on, Sandals Church? How's everybody doing this morning? Come on, make some noise for Jesus in this place. Make so much noise, your neighbor get nervous. This is week two of our series, House Party. Last week was good, but we plan on closing today out pretty strong. So we're going to get right to it. If you got your bulletin, you see the scripture on there, Matthew chapter 9. Uh, if you got your Bible, Matthew chapter 9. If you don't have either of those, they're going to put the scripture up on the screen so that you can follow along with us normal people, okay? Matthew chapter 9, verse 27. The scripture reads, as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, have mercy on us, son of David. When Jesus had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? How many of you would just have your mind blown if you saw something like that? I know I would. I mean, if someone was just like, okay, I'm going to touch you right here. You're going to get your eyes back. My mind would just be like, Poof. and today I pray that God blows our mind. We're going to pray, then we're going to get right to the message, okay? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you are good. We thank you that you live through your word and you live through us. And so, God, we ask that you would change us from the inside out. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today I want to talk to you guys about the life of the party. How many of you are the life of the party that you go to? All right, there's like five people that are the life of the party. I would assume the rest of you are wallflowers. You just kind of stand against the wall and watch the party, observe the party, look at the life of the party, and call them crazy. How many wallflowers are in here today? All right, a bunch of wallflowers. We got to change that by the end of the service. All right, you got to be the life of the party. But the life of the party is normally that one loud person uh, that everyone else kind of looks at. And, and as the music is dancing, they're kind of the one that's dancing offbeat, but they're dancing like really hard. You know that one person in church where praise and worship is happening, and they're just going after. You're like, man, what in the world are they on right now? And they're like, the Holy Spirit. And you're like, no, that is not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> But that one person is always the life of the party. In this passage of Scripture, Jesus is showing why he's the life of the party. Some pretty incredible things are taking place. As a matter of fact, Jesus is like on this healing marathon. People are getting healed. People are getting delivered. People are getting set free. I encourage you to read Matthew chapter 9 in your personal reading this week. But just to kind of fast forward through it, what's happening here, Jesus is en route to go heal a girl who has died. And the father has found Jesus, and he's like, Jesus, uh, listen, my daughter, she has died. I need you to come and resurrect her from the dead. And Jesus is kind of taking his time. He's kind of walking through town. He's kind of looking at uh, some scenery. He, he's he's kind of moseying around with his disciples. And in the meantime, it, it says that a crowd has gathered around Jesus. And there's a lady that's dealing with an issue. She's been dealing with this issue of blood for 12 years, and she can't get to him, but what she does do is she gets to the hem of his garment, and the Bible teaches us that she touches the hem of his garment, and when she made contact with the hem of his garment, she was healed. How many of you know that's pretty baller right there? You, you don't even have to touch the man. You can touch what the man is wearing, and you get healed. That's pretty incredible. It says that Jesus turned around, and he looked at her and said, virtue has left me. The scripture Scripture continues to read, the lady shamingly and being embarrassed, she dropped her head and Jesus told her, lift up your head. And, and she dropped her head because she was ashamed by society. See, by society's standards, she was unclean. And there's a lot of us in here that may be unclean by society's standards, but thank God we serve a Savior that's willing to touch the unclean. We, we serve a Savior that's willing to come into contact with some things that are dead. Is there anyone in here grateful that we serve the true and living Savior that's not afraid to meet you where you are because he's the life of the party? Amen. Jesus 
He turns to this lady and he says, listen, because of your faith, you're healed. She goes about her day. He continues to journey towards this girl who has died. And he gets there. And this girl has been dead for some time. Rigor mortis is starting to set in. And the father's kind of panicking. He, he's kind of in, in a frenzy. He's telling Jesus, Jesus, do something. My daughter's dead. And the Bible says that Jesus kind of chuckles and said, she's asleep. And the father said, no, she's dead. Jesus said, no, no, she's asleep. He prays for her. He lays hands on her. And she comes back to life. How many of you know if you're in that room and you see somebody come back to life, your life is now changed. Can you imagine being in a funeral and the pastor's doing the eulogy and he's like, okay, we go see something a little bit different today. <laughs> I know that he's dead, but he's coming out of that casket today. And you start to see some movement in that casket. How many of you know that room would clear out in a matter of seconds? <laughs> We wouldn't be talking about a miracle. We'll be like, what in the world is going on? It, it would be pretty crazy in that place. And so there's a buzz going on around Jesus. And these two blind men start to hear what's happening. And so they make their way into the presence of Jesus. And, and this is what I believe. This is what I believe they're doing. It, it's kind of like these old school games that we used to play. See, where, where I come from. And the way I was raised, we, we didn't have a lot of video games. There, there wasn't any Fortnite when I was growing up. My parents told us, listen, you get your butt outside, you go play, go bake in the sun for a little while, do something productive. You have not been productive until you smell like outdoors. How many of you know what I'm talking about? There was no Nintendo. There was no Sega Genesis. As a matter of fact, the first game console that we got came out many years before we got it. It was something called the Jaguar. If you have no idea what the Jaguar is, you're not alone. And my parents got that for us, but they got it a long time after it came out. And so we were stuck in the yard making up games because that's what you did in the South where I'm from. You, you had mud, you made mud cakes, you had sticks and you had rocks. You got a nice baseball game going on. And so you had to work with what you had. And so what we would do, we would play this game called Blind Man's Bluff. How many ever heard of it? It's where you put on a blindfold, and it's where you go out into like an open field, and you try to touch the people that you hear, but you're blindfolded, so you can't see anything. There's a pool version of that called Marco Polo. Hey, how many know what I'm talking about? Let's see how many people ever known Marco Polo to be the game of all games. Marco! Marco, Polo. Marco, Polo. somebody played Marco Polo before. But you understood the person that was screaming Polo was where they were based upon where their voice was. You understood when you screamed Marco, the person that was screaming Polo was either to your left, to your right, or in the deep end of the pool if they were mean. It's so cruel for those of you that can swim really, really well, and you play Marco Polo with someone who can't, and you're hiding in the deep end, you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> you're not as saved as you think you are. Shame on you. But the thing that makes Marco Polo so unique is you follow the voice. These, these blind men were following the voice that they heard. I just want you to write this down in your bulletin. I, I like to give you little nuggets that aren't already pre-written on your bulletin so you can do a little work here in church. It's kind of like a big classroom. So write this down. The voice that you listen to will determine the future you experience. The voice that you listen to will determine the future that you experience. These blind men did not know what Jesus looked like. They, they had no idea what he had on. They, they didn't know if his sandals were Nikes or Adidas. They, they did not understand if Jesus was rocking socks with his sandals. They, they did not know these things because they could not see. But the one thing that they could do was listen. And my question to you today is, are you hearing what Jesus is saying? There's a frenzy going on in Scripture because Jesus has healed a woman. He, he's raised 
another girl from the dead, and these two blind men have made up in your mind, if we can just get in the presence of Jesus, we believe that our lives would change. And I'm just curious to know today, how many of you believe that same thing? If we can just get in the presence of Jesus, I believe that my life would change. If, if I could just have an encounter with the true and living Savior, my life will never be the same. I believe that. I believe that the more encounters we have with him, the better our life is because we've had that encounter with him. And so there's two things I want you to take notice of that these two blind men did. These are on your bulletin. You can fill them in. The first one is God honors initiative, not intentions. God honors initiative, not intentions. There, there are a bunch of us in here who intend on doing a lot of things. We intend on doing a lot of things. Isn't it crazy how we judge people by what they've done, but we judge ourselves by what we intended to do? We judge people by what they've done, but we judge ourselves by what we intend to do. Some of us have a lot of things that we intend to do, but God is moved by our initiative not by what we intended to do. The, the second thing I want you to take notice of is that when they moved, God supplied. When they moved, when they moved beyond their comfort zone, when they got up from where they were, when they did something different than what they had been doing, God supplied. And this is what I believe. When you get out of your comfort zone, when you move beyond what you've normally done, God will supply I believe the opposite in our culture and in our society of confidence and courage today isn't cowardness, but it's comfort. We've, we've created a culture where we want to feel comfortable doing the things that we feel comfortable doing. But if you know anything about Jesus, Jesus will always push you beyond your comfort so that you can see some things that you would not normally see. See, if you want to see uncommon things, you have to do uncommon things. If you want to hear the Lord in uncommon ways, you have to make uncommon sacrifices. I've just come to the point in my life where I don't want to just do what's comfortable. I want to do what's uncomfortable so that I can see things that are uncommon. Is there anyone else like that? You're saying, I'm willing to do what is uncomfortable to me so that I can see things that are uncommon. I, I don't want to experience the same thing that I've been experiencing. I want to experience new things. I want to have new experiences. And so if that's my mindset, then I have to do what is uncomfortable. When I move, God provides. It's not my job to provide. It's just my job to believe. And so if we take away anything from these two blind men, it's that they move beyond their comfort and they operated in something called faith to pursue what it was that they believed Jesus desired for them to walk into in this particular season of blindness in their life. And so I want us to look at what type of faith these guys had because they had some type of faith. It wasn't just any faith. It wasn't just, just the mundane, regular, comfortable faith. They had a specific type of faith. So what type of faith moves the hand of God on our behalf? I'm glad you asked. Number one, you have to have a faith that believes when it doesn't see. A faith that believes when it doesn't see. Your future is decided by the voice that you trust. And there's some areas in your life that you can't see how God is going to work those things out. But if you can hear his voice and you can follow his voice and you can be obedient to his voice, then you begin to walk into the things that God desires for you to walk into even when you don't see them and how it's going to play out. If you can just hear what he's saying. God says everything is going to be all right. The voice that you trust will determine the future you walk into. You know, your happiness is determined by whose voice you're willing to ignore. 
Your happiness is determined by whose voice you're willing to ignore. And the reality is we have a lot of people that desire to speak into our lives. But the people that always are Debbie Downers and that always tear you down and always has something more for you to do that's beside what God desires for you to do, how many know you got to block those voices out sometimes? And you have to block out your own voice sometimes because sometimes you are your worst enemy. How many of you have ever said something to you that was kind of discouraging? Be honest with yourself. And so the way you start your day should be a little something like this. Before you put your feet on the ground, before you talk to anyone, before you hear from anyone else, you should desire to hear from Jesus. And you should spend the rest of your day repeating what Jesus said to you in the morning. See, this is the reality. Husbands, I need you to take note of this. I'm about to give you a secret. I'm about to, I'm about to help you out, guys. If I could fist bump every one of you after this, I would. But we have to settle for an air fist bump, okay? But when you repeat what Jesus says, you're never wrong. Come on, guys. What? Guys, I just helped you out so much. In your next, I call it... Not an argument, but a loud conversation. <laughs> if you just repeat what Jesus says, you're never wrong. Amen. Three amens. Men, what in the, let's, okay. <laughs> ladies, I'm going to help you out, okay, ladies? Ladies, if you just repeat what Jesus says, you're never wrong. <laughs> Brothers, what in the world? I just gave you a gimme. And you was like, next question, pass it off to the ladies. <laughs> ladies, use it. Use it, ladies. Repeat what Jesus says, and you're never wrong. That, that, that's so powerful, because when you listen to the voice of Jesus, he always leads you, and he always guides you into perfect truth. So you can't listen to yourself. You have to listen to what he says, and then you have to repeat over you what Jesus says about you. Because sometimes you don't always feel up to par. Sometimes you don't always look up to par. But thank God we serve a Savior that always calls us into a place beyond where we are because he sees more in us than what we could possibly see in ourselves. You have to have a faith that believes when it doesn't see. Number two, you have to have a faith that persists. These, these two blind men, it says that they cried out to Jesus. This, this particular word, cry out, in the Greek is a word called chryzo, which means an animalistic cry. It's, it's a form of worship. It says that they cried out to Jesus. It says that they shouted to the top of their lungs. And sometimes you get in environments like this, and you get in the midst of worship, and you're like, it doesn't take all of that. Do, you, do they have to be that loud? Do, do they have to shout as loud as they're shouting? But, but the reality is you, you can't understand someone's praise until you understand someone's problems. And, and, and you can't understand why someone is praising God the way that they're praising God until you put yourself in their shoes. These two men were desperate for Jesus to heal them, so they didn't care who was looking at them. And the reality is, a lot of us praise and worship God based out of preference. I, I give you this, this example. A, a lot of us would say, hey, I, I'm not that type. That, that's not my personality. Uh, I'm not the loud type. And, and, and I would go as far as to say, listen, if I was to say, hey, I'll give you a million dollars if you scream to the top of your lungs right now, this room would erupt like crazy with people screaming to the top of their lungs. So it has nothing to do with your personality. It has everything to do with your preference. See, when your preference sets the precedence for your praise, it limits your ability to see what God desires for you to see. But you have to move yourself to a place of de desperation where you're persistent to praise and worship God beyond your comfort. See, when you move yourself to that place, then you begin to push yourself beyond what it is that you used to do and beyond what it is that you're, you, you would normally do into a place that's uncomfortable. You, you, you don't care who's looking at you because you're blind and you can't see them anyway. You, you don't care who hears you because you're desperate. The reality is the person sitting beside you doesn't have a heaven or a hell to place you in, so what difference does it make what they think about you in the first place? 
I just, I want to give you this little nugget right here. Stop letting people who do so little for you control so much of you. Stop letting people who do so little for you control so much of you. We, we, we come into environments like this where Jesus desires to do something for us, and, and we allow what people think to control what we do. But you have to come out of that prison. You have to break out of those chains. You have to remove yourself from up under that weight and say, God, you've been too good to me for me to remain quiet. I, I, I come, and I'm desperate for you to do something significant in my life, and I don't care who's watching. Because I'm desperate. The reality is when, when you're desperate and you're blind, it doesn't matter who's watching you. Because your desire is to encounter a savior. You have to have a faith that's persistent. It says that they cried out to Jesus and Jesus went indoors. They kept crying out. It says that Jesus turned to them and said, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And if you leave with nothing else today, you have to ask yourself that question. Do I really believe that Jesus is able to do this? Do, do I really believe that what I'm in, Jesus is capable of bringing me out of? Do, do I truly believe that this tough, hard, difficult situation is not impossible to him because he is the God of all impossibilities coming to pass in my life. See, once again, it's not our job to provide. It's not our job to perform. It's our job to believe. These two blind men said, yes, Lord. It says that Jesus laid hands on them and said, because of your faith, you may now see. See, this is what I know to be true. Jesus meets us at the place of our expectation. If they wouldn't have believed, guess what? They would have remained blind. But the fact that they believed, even when they couldn't see, the fact that they believed, even when Jesus didn't acknowledge them the first time, the fact that they believed, even when it, they did not know how th this thing would turn out, means that they were persistent. And sometimes we stop knocking at the first closed door we see. When, in fact, closed doors aren't no's from God. Closed doors are redirection to open doors that he has for us. If you remain persistent, God says, I'll provide in the areas that you need me to provide in. Do you believe that I'm able to do this? A faith that persists. See, your limitation isn't what you don't have. It's what you don't use. Your limitation isn't what you don't have. It's what you don't use. These men could have settled for, I can't see. I, 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 can't, I can't move because I can't see. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how this thing is going to play out. But they said, you know what? As long as we have the ability to hear, we can move in the direction of what we're hearing. I hear something happening, and I want to go to what I hear is the life of the party. Jesus is always the life of the party. He, he always has life in him. He says, I come that you may have life and life more abundantly. Jesus always provides life to those that are willing to receive the life that he provides. Is there anyone in here grateful that Jesus says, I am everything you need me to be and so much more if you allow me to be? But you have to have a faith that's persistent. Number three. You have to have a faith that is willing to put in work. A faith that is willing to put in work. See, there's a difference between hope and faith. Hope is a desire. Faith is a demonstration. We can hope all we want to, but until that hope turns into faith and until we put action to what we believe, will never see the things that Jesus desires for us to see. I want to read to you James chapter 2, verse 22. It says, you see that Abraham's faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. I'm going to read that to you again. It says, you see that Abraham's faith 
and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. There's another passage of scripture which I love. It says, faith without works is dead. And the reality for all of our lives is as powerful as the word is, as life-changing as scripture is, as beneficial as it could be, if we don't work the word, the word won't work for us. We have to have a faith that's willing to put in work. In Hebrews chapter 11, the King James Version, it's so powerful but so confusing at the same time. And I just want to highlight and uplift what I believe we can walk away with today. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If you're reading that, it's a little confusing because it says faith is the substance of things you hope for. How can you have substance in something that you're hoping for? How can you have evidence of something that you have not seen? And whenever you read a scripture like this that really doesn't make sense at first glance, how many of you know you got to dig a little deeper? And so I've done the hard work for us today. I, I've dug a little deeper. I want to read to you what, what this scripture actually means because in the Bible, substance is only found five times in this context and evidence is only found three times. The first time that this word substance is found is Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. And it says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. That, that word person is the same word substance. It says, and upholding all things by the word of his power. And he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So the TIV version the Tim International Version of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, can be read like this. Now faith is the person of Jesus that we hoped for. It's what we put our faith in to see. See, Jesus is the substance. And Jesus is the evidence. Because Jesus is the life of the party. But until we put our faith in Jesus, we won't see the things that we've been believing for. And a lot of us, we put our faith in something instead of someone. See, when we put our faith in someone, all things work out the way that they're supposed to work out. But when we put our faith in something, when something doesn't go the way that we planned it to, we get disappointed and we get let down and our faith begins to dwindle because our faith was in something instead of someone. And our faith has to be in someone. And that someone's name is Jesus. Guess what? Putting your faith in Jesus sometimes is hard work because you can't physically see him. The word of God says, blessed are those more that believe when they have not yet seen. So you have to have a faith that is willing to put in work. And, and that's, that's difficult because we are wanted now people. We, we drive up to drive throughs We want the food out and hot in a matter of minutes. But if you know anything about food, you know good food takes some time to cook. You don't know anything about food, okay. <laughs> good food takes time to cook. Some fast food places you go to, you get the food, and you can leave the food in the bag for months. And it looks the same way. That's not real food. I don't know what that is. But you shouldn't put that in your body. Whenever fries stay the same over a span of years, how many of you know those aren't real potatoes? But anything worth having takes time to get. And if we're going to have the things that Jesus desires for us to have, we have to 
put in the work to see what it is that he desires for us to see. And sometimes we're like, God, I want cake. And if you know anything about a party, a party isn't a party without cake. And this is a house party. So I bought cake. But we're like, Jesus, I want cake. And I want my cake to already have the icing on it with the sprinkles, fluffy, light, and delicious, slightly rich, but not too rich, sweet, but not too sweet. And Jesus is like, yeah, I'll give you cake, but it doesn't look like this. It looks like this. And you're like, but Jesus, I want cake. And he's like, I've given you cake. Jesus, I want it fluffy. I want it slightly rich, but not too rich. Sweet, but not too sweet. And he's saying, I've given you everything that you need, but you got to put in the work to see it. And I can feel some judgmental bakers in here like, he has box cake, oh my God. What is he doing with that box cake? Listen, you judgmental people. I didn't have time to bring flour, sugar, water, eggs, baking soda as this demonstration, okay? So just work with me. But everything you need, he's already given you. You just have to put in the work so that you can see what it is you desire to see. See, Jesus isn't going to give you something that's pre-made. He's going to give you something that you have to work for. And once you put in the work for what it is that you are expecting, you start to see what it is that you desire to see. See, see Noah was told that there was a flood coming. He was told, hey, you and your family need to get on a boat. And it would have been easy for God to just drop a cruise ship out of the sky. Would have been easy. I mean, he's the creator of all things. He's the master, the ruler. He's the alpha and the omega. He created the heavens and the earth. It would have been nothing for him to snap his fingers in a cruise ship drops right in front of him. But he said, Noah, there's an ark in you. There are some trees. There are some beavers. Get to work. And everything that God gives you, he doesn't make for you. He places the ingredients on the inside of you for you to make. Because it's far more meaningful when you work with him to see what it is you've been praying for manifest than it is if he was just to give it to you. See, my father used to always tell me, son, there's no free lunch in life. And I would say, but dad, it says it's free. It says it's free. He says, listen, I know what the sign says, but somewhere, somehow, someone is paying for you to eat free. And although salvation is free, Jesus paid the price for us. And if Jesus paid the price for us, how many of you know there's some things that you have to pay the price for as well? It would have been easy for God to put Goliath's head on the stake for David, but he didn't. He said, here's five stones. Are you willing to to work those five stones to get the victory. See, God isn't going to give you everything that you've been hoping for already done. He's going to give you the ingredients and you have to work your faith to see those things manifest in your life. These these blind men, they had the ingredients. They, They had the faith. They were willing to put action to their faith. But they understood in order for us to see this miracle happen, we have to cry out. 
And I truly believe today you have the ability to see Jesus do something significant in your life because you have the ingredients on the inside of you. But are you willing to cry out to Jesus? Or are you willing to say, God, I believe that you are able to do this. I believe that you are able to deliver me out of everything that I'm going through because you are the life of the party. Stand to your feet. So this is what I want us to do. I want us to move beyond our comfort today. I'm not going to ask you to scream like an animal. I'm not going to ask you to do that. But I am going to ask you to move beyond what you would normally do in your comfort zone. So if you normally come and when praise and worship is going on, you don't lift your hands. I'm going to ask that you just go ahead and position your hands here. This is what I call holding the baby. <laughs> just go ahead, hold that baby right here. If you say, I've been, I've been rocking that baby for a little bit, I'm ready to move to the next level. Let's go ahead to field goal position, okay? You say, I've been in field goal position for seven months, I'm ready to transition to the next level. Full extension, come on, full extension, full extension, full extension. And what you're saying when you lift those hands is, God, I surrender my all to you. I believe that you're able. I believe that you're capable. I believe that you're willing. And so today, God, I'm going to do something that I normally wouldn't do. I'm going to worship you. And this is why worship is so significant, because worship is the one thing that God can't do. Because in order to worship something, it implies that there's something higher than me. And there is nothing higher than God. And so when we worship God, what we're saying is, God, you are the highest. You're higher than my problems. You're higher than my sickness. You're higher than my tests, my trials, my tribulations. And God, I believe that as I lift my hands to you and sacrifice today, you'll see it and you'll heal me and you'll set me free because you are the life of the party. Is there anyone thankful that Jesus is the life of the party in here? Come on, make some noise in this place. Jesus is the life of the party.